So last week I had a stock that crashed absolutely huge. It was down around about 30 plus percent last week and it's been a long time since I've had a stock like that going to free fall. And today I thought I'd talk about what is going on with this stock and if I'm gonna sell, am I gonna buy, my updated thoughts on what's going on with this stock at the moment. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Let's get started. So D-Local had a horrible week last week. This stock was down 28% in the last five days. And year to date, the stock is now down 44%. So this is not doing well at all. And this is a relatively new position into my portfolio. This is one of my new 2024 stocks into the portfolio. And when you do buy a stock, it could probably go up in the short term, it could go down in the short term, but it's quite rare that you'll have one that absolutely explodes or absolutely crashes, which this one has. It's absolutely crashed since I bought it. Now, as a new stock into the portfolio, this is going to be one of my key stocks that I need to do very well in the next few years. So if I have a good 2025, 2026, 27, it'd probably be because of this new batch of stocks that has come into the portfolio. If you look at 2023, for example, why did I have such a good 2023? Why did I outperform the S&P 500 that year? It's because I bought so many good stocks in 2022. So that set me up really well. When you look at 2020. Two, for example, why did I have such a bad year in 2022? It's because I didn't buy good enough stocks in 2021. So this is why I always need these new stocks to come into the portfolio to perform really well. And every so often there's a couple of stocks that don't perform very well, but what really does hurt is if you have a, an absolute stinger of a stock, which uh, the local so far has been an absolute stinger of a stock. So we do need to see this start turning around sometime soon. But obviously there was an update out and, that, and the market didn't like the update. So we'll go through the update that came out. I've split it up into two parts. I've split it, split it up into a bad part, which there definitely is more bad points, obviously, with the stock going down nearly 30%. There's more bad parts, but there was some good parts in this earnings part as well that we'll, uh, that we'll point out. So first of all, let's have a look at the numbers. So EPS came in at 0 0.06, which missed by 0 0.06. <laughs> yeah, so obviously an EPS me a, a, a miss, a bit of a decent miss there. Um, EPS guides are always quite tricky for D-Local because of the exchange rates. They're always all over the place. Um, so there is some leeway there. Um, however, I would, I would, personally for me, I would expect the EPS to probably come in probably 0 0.02 higher than where it did on this report. Revenue of 184 million, uh, which was 34% year over year growth, which is, by the way, still pretty impressive, isn't it? You know, a lot of companies wish they, would, they could grow at 34% year over year growth. Um, however, it did miss by 5 million. So there was a dual miss here. They did not change the guidance though. But obviously um, we don't want to see that much misses. Um, and also what's worth pointing out is 34% year over year growth is still pretty impressive. A lot of companies wish they could grow 34% year over year. And when you're a company trend at 17 times earnings, that's a pretty good growth. But the growth wasn't an issue. The issue was the profitability. And you can look at total payment volumes. They looked all really good. Revenue up, uh, net revenue retention rate. Um, but when you get further down, this is where it gets a little bit messy and this is what the market didn't like. Gross profit only up 2% um, year over year, adjusted even down 90% year over year. And that's what the market didn't like and that's why the market sold this stock off last week. And um, as Pedro, Pedro and started the conference call, he basically summed it up very well. Uh, we started off the year very strong, uh, especially on the revenue growth point of view. But the problem is, is when you get down the P&L and you get lower down, that's where it gets a little bit messy in the, in the market and that's where they weren't happy with what went on there. Now, what was actually quite good to see is I, I like when a CEO comes out and says like, look, this isn't to our expectations. We want to have better numbers than this. I, I really don't like it when a CEO comes out and, and, and addresses it like, yeah, it, it was a really good report. You know, Pedro Ann, I think, summed it up perfectly. We're really happy with our growth. The growth is good. The issue is our profitability. We're not happy with the profitability. And, and I like that. I like that he just called it how it was. I don't like anyone trying to cover up the cracks. I don't like anyone saying, oh, the weather was really bad. It rained a little bit. I don't like it when the, the CEOs don't admit that there isn't an issue there. So that was really good. He basically put it down to three points. Now, I'm not going to lie. There's probably more than three points here. But he put it down to three key points. I'll point a few more of them out a little bit later on. So first of all, one of our largest merchants achieved a new level in our tiered pricing scheme. Fair enough, um, I'm not sure, you probably would have been able to see this forecast though in the last quarter, so I don't know if that's really something to put down there. You probably should have been able to work this out as a, 
CEO, maybe CFO. I mean, generally there was a new CFO in this quarter, so maybe there was a bit of crossover where the CFO was still trying to learn the ropes a little bit and he wasn't able to forecast this and the transi transition part of your point of view. So I don't really buy this thing that they put down here. And if it is such a big upset, I mean, they should have really forecast this. They should have seen like the income coming in going like, oh, they're gonna cross a new threshold. We need to price that into our guidance. This is more of the reason, I believe. And also renegotiated fees as their contract came up for renewal. Given our still relatively high concentration on top 10 merchants, such a high volume price tiering alongside the re renegotiation directly impacted our revenue growth. So basically this client entered a new tiering um, pricing scheme, but I think the main reason is they renegotiated their fees. Now listen to the conference call. I think if you have enough time and you have enough details, I reckon some of these analysts will actually be able to work out who that top 10 client is. However, what it sound, sound like to me is that it was one of their, not just only a top 10 client, I believe it was one of their largest clients that this was. And I feel like listening to the conference call, I mean, they tried to dress it up like, oh, they're still pay, paying a lot higher than what they could do elsewhere. But it sounded like to me, they didn't want to lose them. For them, it was more important to give them a better fee than losing them. Uh, I think that's the big thing that they wanted to say. Now, what this worries for me is that the fact that they were able to renegotiate it. If, I mean, let's say the other top 10 clients see this and go, hold on, so-and-so just rene renegotiated their fees. Hold on, why don't we do that? And the fact that companies are able to renegotiate makes me a little bit worried in the next few years how many of those other top 10 clients might get a little bit of wind of this and go, you know what, we wanna pay a bit lower fees. Now, over a longer term point of view, I think they will, a lot of clients will play lower fees because the fees that the local do make are so high. That's why they make so much profitability. But the fact they were able to renegotiate makes me a little bit nervous. That, this was the worst point for me in this whole report is that they are able to renegotiate fees and it have such an impact. Now I said that our product mix shifted towards lower monetizing payout volumes with core paying verticals such as e-commerce and advertising are seasonally weaker in Q1. So same again, I thought they would be able to forecast this. You know, I think they are saying like, oh, we're more of an e-commerce. Um, we have so much exposure to e-commerce now. Q1 is always weak. Yeah, fair enough. But shouldn't you be able to forecast now? Like if you look at progressive of Q1s, wouldn't you see that that's coming more and more of your part of your business? So again, um, so they do have a lot of e-commerce and advertising clients. So we'll we'll take that and say like hopefully we start seeing the re recovering q2 q3 q4 but i say again I, I just feel like the cfo could have forecast that delay delays in our merchants in new important launches that's scheduled for q1 uh slowing an anticipated volume ramp ups fair enough you know they are going to be a little bit impacted by other businesses and um, that's fair enough i can see that every so often that oh we, we thought this was going to come in that that always happens in this sort of business so i'm sure there was some of that in here and um, tighter effect spreads in argentina and lower cross-border mix compared to a year ago so argentina was a big impact and obviously we've seen the situation in argentina at the moment and um, we'll get onto that in a little bit but obviously that was a bit of an impact to the business as well which is fair enough um I've, i you know obviously there's a ship shareholder in mercado libra I could confirm that is an issue going on. So I understand that reason. So there's a few that I understand, but there's a few that I was like, that's a little bit worrying and we need to watch that at the same time. Now, overall, I think Pedro Ant, who obviously came in from Mikado Libra into D-Local, did a pretty good job on the conference call, um, which I think is worth pointing out. But one of the big things that drove profitability down massively, and I'm, I don't know why this wasn't on here, was actually this part. And then finally, we decided to sustain our planned investment increases that support long-term growth. So they invested a lot into the business, and I mean a lot. When you look at some of the costs, if it wasn't for some of these costs that came in, it would have been a lot more profitable. And that was also a big impact on the business. And what I'll do is I'll actually show you some of those costs that came in in a little bit. Now they're, 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 they're saying like, oh look, it's investment for long term. We do these costs now, they'll help us with the growth in the long term. We'll see what happens. It, it, it's, a, it's a really tricky one. Do you believe that it's right for them right now to be investing in for the long term? Or should they've managed those costs a little bit better? We'll see that in a little bit more detail in a little bit more further, further down the line. Now this was a bit more detail on the revenue on the impact of Argentina. So you can see here down 31% year over year. Uh, we had the devaluation that's going on and also Argentina saw a decline in TPV volume. Obviously the volume, if we remember at the start was like 50 plus percent. So that was obviously an impact that was going on. Basically, you know, a lot of merchants at the moment have pulled out from Argentina because of the macro environment 
instability. Always a pl that's always a risk with this sort of business when you're operating these emerging markets. They said that Chile was also a drag on our year over year revenue growth down 13%, primarily due to a customer churn. So they said that one of their financial services merchants, that they didn't lose their merchant, but they that financial service partner saw volume decl decline because they lost a significant market, uh, client in the market. So they're saying that it wasn't an issue of us, our client lost a client and then that had a knock on to us. So same again, they're trying to say, look, it's not a problem with us, they still wanna work with us, they're, it's just they're not executing and that had a knock on effect to us. So you can see here, when you get further down, there was more than the issues that they, they did do at the start, there was a few more issues, obviously the Chile issue at the moment, obviously the Argentina issue at the moment, so that, that was also something else that was going on in the background. And obviously with the Argentina issue, we can see, we, we, I'm sure you've seen the issue that's going on with the inflation issue um, and it's the way that they're tackling that at the moment in Argentina, that's having a knock-on knock effect uh, with the business at the moment. And more about their hiring, as you can see here, they were talking about the more in investing side of it. And you see that they, they brought in 951 people as well. So uh, they said that they're, they're making sure they're investing uh, for the future here. So you get a bit more detail on those expenses. Now, when you do start looking at the numbers, you can see, like we said, at the top, it looks good. TPV was good, revenue was good. But when you get lower down and you really start seeing those impacts on the, on the profitability. And you can see there was a decline of 50% on the profit, profitability. Now, obviously, is still a profitable business. We're not talking about a company that has just gone from no profit to unprofitable, uh, sorry, profitable to unprofitable. They're still throwing off relatively decent amounts of profitability here. You know, 17 million is no small number on 184 million. Like that's still, you know, a 10% profit margin. Like it's, you know, obviously it's been hit, but it's not like it's totally fallen to worrying levels at the moment. So I think that's probably worth pointing out. Like it's ugly, but let's not forget this is still profit that's coming to the bottom line here. When you look at, look at Latin America, as you can see here, uh, now accounting for 68% of the revenue. Brazil and Mexico were still strong, the largest markets up 89% year over year, 50% in Mexico. Africa and Asia as well, still grew by 51%, which is still good. Uh, one of the big things is the new expansion to Egypt, uh, growing by 11x year over year, which is very positive. And that offset as well, the 73% year on year decline in Nigeria. So you can see here that all the other areas are making up for an issue that's going on in, in the devaluation of the Naira in Nigeria at the moment. So that's another weak part of the business, but obviously overall still growing really well in that kind of area. And you can see here that LATAM gross profit decreased 8%. A lot of that caused for because of the Argentina. If it wasn't for Argentina, as you can see here, um, it grew 24% year over year, which is obviously you know pretty impressive. Africa and Asia, there's no issue there. Gross profit actually increased 60% year over year. So you can see relatively the gross profit was about the same from where we were a year ago. And obviously without Argentina, it would have been a, a little bit higher as you see here. But you can see really the big increase of the expenses here. Technology and development was up and you look at G&A. I mean, look at the increase of G&A. That's a massive increase there. So you can see profit before tax, profit before income tax would have been a lot closer if it wasn't for a lot of the reinvestments into the business as well. There's also a bigger income tax expense as well. So really when you look at the profit, for the period there's a lot of investments that are here for the longer term as you can see here coupled with obviously the big impacts on the gross profit from the likes of argentina for example but overall i mean the company is still growing very strong and the company is still throwing off a really good amount of profitability balance sheet wise i mean you've still got a very clean balance sheet and you look at the cash i mean they've got 680 million of cash which for a 2.8 billion market cap company you're around about 30% of your market cap in cash, which is still very healthy. And obviously the reason why they're there is because obviously they throw off that much profitability as well. And even though I've gone through a lot of bad points at the start of the video, you can still see there's a lot of positives out there. When you look at Africa and Asia, still doing very well. You look at some of the new markets that look, they're launching in, especially like Egypt, uh, where TP volume was up 71%. There's still a lot of growth there, as you can see here. Trend-wise, this was on the conference call. They said that performance got better as the quarter progressed with a weak first two months of the year, totaling 37 million in gross profit, while March gross profit came in at 25 million, which is above Q4 levels. So you see here, like they said that January and February were weak, but March is was a, a really big improvement. And if that continues to improve, that'd be absolutely amazing. I was a little bit cautious why they didn't mention April, because obviously they probably would have had the data for April at the time. So I don't know if that's had a little bit of a step back, but as you can see here, if that was truly a, a weak start to the year and then we are starting to still improve, 
and um, that'd be really good if that is the the case here and like we said on the conference call the, the liquidity position is still very good and that's why they were also able to announce a new two 200 million share buyback so with the drop that you have in the stock at the moment at 2.8 billion i mean they're going to be buying back about 10 percent of the market cap so even though the profitability is dropping because there's going to be a lot of less shares outstanding that's actually going to level out the profitability at least a little bit here so that's also that's a really big buyback and as we've seen before they are still a profit beast and they've still got a really good balance sheet so that's obviously another really good positive that i think because it went under the radar because of everything else and um, that was a really good addition to the stock and realistically you know we're still down at 19 times forward earnings and i know there's a few issues here but for 19 forward times earnings is something that I kind of reflected in here so overall, my thoughts are is that you can see there's definitely some things that went wrong in this quarter. It wasn't a good quarter, um, and I would probably give it 3 out of 10. So there's definitely a lot of things that went wrong. But there was still a few positives in the background that I think were missed because of the, um, the negatives in here. And overall, I mean, the stock is down 44% year to date, and it had a 30% drop off these earnings. Now, I look at the stock itself, and I mean, it IPO'd in 2021 and the stock has fallen 72 percent since that time frame i look at the company from when it ipo to where it is at now and when it ipo'd it was doing 44 million in profitability and 126 million in revenue i look where it's going to close at the end of the year and it's going to be 870 million in revenue and 167 million in profitability so there's been a big improvement on the profit and revenue and yet the stock is now far lower than where it was on its IPO levels which is uh, which is crazy and I just think there's a lot of negativity priced in here and I look at the drop to, that happened and I thought you know what I can understand why the stock dropped if, you, if profits declining that much I understand there's a drop I don't think the stock should be down 44% year to date though and I don't think the stock should be down 30% off those earnings so I thought yeah it's a bad quarter but I don't think it should have been down that much and, and let's not forget, it's still it's still it's still very profitable, and that's why it's able to do them big share buybacks, a cracking balance sheet as well. The big thing that, that I took away is that I don't like the client negotiating pricing power. That's definitely something that's a little bit of a worry for me, uh, which is new that I definitely will be uh, worried about. But as we can see, the management really talked it up like this is investment for long term. We had a slow start. We start to see things slowly start improving at the moment. And um, Pedro Ant summed it up on the conference call is that. He just thinks it's one of those quarters. He said that normally we have, because we're so exposed in many markets, we have these fluctuations where a certain area is weak. But for this quarter, it's just that we had a lot more weaker than stronger parts and it's just hit us a little bit harder than what it normally would do. And he thinks that he says over long term, it should, you know, these things normally balance out and over long term, it should start balancing out. And that's his point of view is that it's just that we've had all these things kind of come wrong at once when normally they balanced out a lot more. And it depends if you believe him. You know, management were on, on that conference call really saying, like, look, long-term game plan is still there. Everything is going, look, it wasn't a good quarter on the profitability point of view, but everything's set up to recover. And we've also seen the improvement so far as the Q1 went on. So my thoughts are is that I am slightly less bullish on this stock because of the issue around the negotiation power that clients potentially could have. However, this is still a company with a cracking balance sheet and a lot of profitability and a lot of growth. So my thoughts are is that this is not a good quarter and I am kind of waiting for Q2 a little bit now to kind of see, okay, did the management tell us the truth? Uh, and management telling us the truth where we are going to see that improvement continue and it was just one of those quarters where everything that went wrong went wrong wrong and actually this is a good buying opportunity. So I'm going to wait for Q2 for that confirmation of like oh, it was just a one-off or if Q2 was another warning quarter, then I get worried. So my plan is basically to see what happens in Q2. If Q2 is another bad quarter, and management basically told us quite a few fibs, I probably will sell out at Q2 and just kind of cut it there. And I also want to be careful the way I'm not like, I've had some stocks before, and this is what really hurt me in 2021, where I had stocks that were on this downtrend, and the financials deteriorated, and I kept buying because management said, it's gonna improve, it's gonna improve, and it didn't. And I got, you know, I got told a lot of fibs there. So with, D local I'm kind of being patient and if it does get bad after two quarters I'm just going to cut it and run but I probably will still buy probably once or twice on this dip and just take advantage of nine dollars because what will happen here is that Q basically if Q2 is a bad report it might go down another 10 percent and I might take a bit of a hit on it where I have to sell for like a 50 percent loss and I just cut it there but if this is 
another good quarter. If this, if the, if the quarter that comes off of Q2 is a good quarter, the stock will rebound massively. And you'll look at this and go, wow, D-Local actually got down to you know $9. We should have been buying. And, the, and, and in, in three months' time, it'll be one of those that in hindsight looks so obvious. You know, you'll, you'll look back on this in a few months' time and you go, wow, $9. You should have been buying aggressively. But at the same time, it could easily work out in a few months' time where you look back and go, oh, well, look at Q1. There was warning signs there that it was going wrong. Should have sold in Q1. It's easy in hindsight when we look back in a few months' time. But right now, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do we believe management where this Q1 report was just a combination of things where everything kind of went wrong here? Or is it one of those where actually there's a few cracks starting to appear here? And this is where it comes really tricky with investing. This is where the little risk does appear. And certainly with a stock like this that has a lot of these currency fluctuations, this is why I always said this is a smaller position for me because of this factor, because of these currency and because it operates in these emerging markets, it has to be a smaller position. But that's that's basically my plan. That's my plan is that I'm gonna see where Q2 is at. If Q2 is bad, I'm just gonna cut it and run. If Q2 is good, I'll feel a lot more confident. I'll start buying a bit more, more, bit more uh, and add to the position and realize it was actually just a one-off kind of quarter. So I probably will nibble once or twice here, but I will be quite cautious until we get to, to Q2 and see where we're at there. So that's my thoughts overall. It's, it's a very tricky position at the moment because this could be one of those stocks that you look back in in a few months time and go, wow, that was a steal at $9. Uh, but it could quite easily be a stock that you look back on in three months time and go, wow, the cracks were showing, you know, clients were ne negotiating the rates. That was a worrying sign. So it's a tricky one, guys. It's a really, really tricky one, this one. Um, so that's my thoughts at the moment. And uh, I think we'll have a better cute idea in, in um, Q2. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Hope you enjoyed the video on the local guys and I'll catch you in a bit.